John 17. If you have a Bible, please grab it. Um, I think there are some Bibles under the, there behind you, Paul, under the, um, under the thing. If anybody needs a Bible, I'd encourage you to have a Bible. We are, we're in a, we're in a piece of scripture and it's the last three verses of John 17. You know that I planned to do the last three verses of John 17. Obviously, I planned to do that last week already and we didn't get there. And then this week, that was going to be kind of the intro and then we were going to go into John 18. We were going to cross the book, Brook Kidron. Um, we're not going to cross the Brook Kidron, but we're going to take some serious, serious ground this morning. There is truth here which is absolutely mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Let's just let's pray for the Word and, and I, I ask that you pray for me as well because I... Uh, to get this across is important. This is, this is incredibly, incredibly important stuff. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you, Lord. We know that true worshippers of you will worship in spirit and in truth, Lord. As we open your truth, we pray that your Holy Spirit, Father, would just fill us. Lord, that you would give us understanding, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, I pray that, Lord, the words of my mouth would be transformed even into the ears of the hero lord and let it not be about man lord i pray that man would decrease in every sense that you would be high and lifted up father i pray that you'd speak to us from your word even this morning excite us draw us nearer lord give us a glimpse of your glory lord even as moses would have prayed let us see your face and father we know that no man has seen the face of god because no man can and live but lord allow us to know you Allow us to see your glory. We have the incarnation of Christ Jesus. In you is the radiance. In him is the radiance of your glory. Lord, let us see Jesus. Make yourself real to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. John chapter 17 and verse 24. We're going to build a foundation. We're going to build a foundation. Then we're going to come back and have a look at John again. And I've gone right past it. So the, the three verses that we're looking at in John chapter 17 are these from verse 24 and in these verses we're going to see the two last i haves in this prayer of christ we're going to see i have known you and i have declared your name but we're also going to see for the only time in scripture where it's for for christ's purpose he will say i desire remember the lord is about the father's business jesus came to do the will of the Father, and here in John 17 is the one place where we're going to see Jesus say, I desire, I desire. Remember that this prayer is in context of you and I. It's for those who will believe, according to the word of the apostles who he's prayed for from, um, from verse 6 through to 19. Of course, that prayer 6 through to 19 includes us in many aspects, but isn't as specific as 20 through to 26, where he's specifically praying for those who will believe on their word, which is you and I here today. Verse 24 says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you, get, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now we can be tempted to read that and say, I've got it. I've got it. I understood it. The words made sense, and, and we can move on. But we would be amiss if we did that, because there are some deep, incredible truths that Jesus is teaching us as he's praying to the Father. And so the first thing he says in verse 24 is, Father, I desire. We see Christ saying the words, I desire, one other place, one other place, but it's in context of a quotation of the Old Testament scriptures of Isaiah 6, verse 6. And we get that from Matthew 9, verse 13. And he's having a duel with the Pharisees. I'm not going to turn to Matthew 9, 13, but that's the reference. He's having a duel with the Pharisees. And he says, this is what God desires. And he quotes from Hosea 6, and we'll be going to Hosea 6. He quotes from Hosea 6, and he says, I desire mercy. I desire mercy. The, he, he quotes that scripture but he's quoting it as the father would quote it. He's quoting it as the father said it. Here, his desire 
is actually his desire. This is the desire of Christ. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 very quickly because Hebrews chapter 10 takes us into Psalm 40. And Psalm 40 will then lead us into that passage in Hosea. So bear with us. We're going to jump through a couple of scriptures now. These scriptures will build the foundation for the understanding of where Christ is coming from. So chapter 10 in Hebrews says, almost from, from, from chapter 9, it speaks about the, the, the earthly sanctuary and then the limitations of the earthly sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, and then the mediator, which was necessary by death. The greatness of Christ's sacrifice brings us into chapter 10. Chapter 10 will speak about the animal sacrifices being insufficient and then how Christ's death fulfills God's will. So chapter 10, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with the same sacrifices. Now speaking of the sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, those sacrifices could never make those who approached perfect. Did you read that one correctly? It breaks up a little bit. There's a, there's a, um, a thought in between. But those sacrifices which are offered year after year can never make one perfect. And here's the argument. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. Would they not have ceased to be offered? If they could make you perfect, well then they only had to be done once. And that's exactly what's happened in Christ. We know that. But in the Old Testament, we see them over and over again. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But, though, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, the sacrificial system. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, because of this, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire this is not the desire of God sacrifice and offering was not the desire of God necessarily it was how we could come to God he desired that we could come to him the way that that was possible was through atoning sacrifice a covering not a removing of sin but it was a covering and therein there would be a communion but sacrifice and offering primarily you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure then i said behold i have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will O god so if sacrifice and offerings are not the lord's desire what then is the lord's desire and for that we've got to turn back to hosea chapter 6 one of the small uh, the small prophets um, just past daniel if you keep on turning, you'll get Joel and Amos and Jonah. So Hosea chapter 6, I'll give you the page number, but you've got different Bibles. Hosea chapter 6. Now this is a, a, a call to repentance. And in the call to repentance, there's a reminder to Israel about what they are like. And perhaps it's a, a reminder to us of, of, in many ways, what we're like. And it says, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. Your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. What good is a morning cloud in the heat of the day is burned away? Your faithfulness is burned away, he says to Israel. He says, your faithfulness is like the early dew, which goes away, the early dew will go away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have cut them down by the prophets, he says. I've made example of them by the prophets, the words which the prophets would speak. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. You can't, be, you can't escape the light that goes forth. You turn on a light, you can't run, run away from the light. That's what he's saying. And your judgments are like a light that goes forth. For I desire, this is God speaking, I desire mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. 
He desires knowledge of God yeah. more than burnt offerings. You know that we've been in John 17, 3 for the last, I don't know, probably two months now. We've been in John 17 for the last two months. But John 17, 3, what is eternal life? That you would know God. That you would know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Micah 6, um, verses 6 through 8 speaks about God not wanting thousands of rams being sacrificed. That's not what he wants, but what he wants is that we would do justly, that we would love mercy, that we would walk humbly. These are the things that the Lord would desire. But he gave us the Ten Commandments, and then he gave us the sacrificial system, and surely he desires us to be sacrificing. And why would he say that? that I mean, the sacrificial system is such a huge part of the whole um, Old Testament. It's the hugest part of the New Testament, isn't it? The sacrifice of Christ. It's what our entire faith, the resurrection of Christ plainly, but our entire faith speaks into sacrifice. God does not, does not desire sacrifice. What he desires is fellowship with you and I. He desires that we would have knowledge of God, that we would know God, because to know God is to have eternal life. To know God is, to, it's so exciting, to know God yeah. is to have eternal life. Did Jesus know God? Well, we've just read, he said, I have known you. Did Jesus have eternal life? He is he's the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. Why is it that he could continue eternal life whilst he was still here on earth? Because he knew the Father. This is his desire now. Jesus' desire is that they whom you gave me, speaking to the Father, those whom the Father has given him may be with Jesus. Jesus desires... There is nobody else in your lives. There's nobody else in my life and there's nobody else. And it works both directions that you want to be with all the time. Let's be honest. There is nobody in your life that you want to be with every living, waking second of your life. And if you do, good for you. But it, it's not going to measure up to the way that Christ wants to be with us. Christ says his desire is that we would be with him where I am. He's speaking as if the work is completed. He's speaking as if the work is already completed. In 1633, we know that he said, I have overcome the world again, speaking as if the work was already completed. But he says, I desire that they would be with me. That, that word with me is meta. Now, there's a few of you who understand sort of the data sciences and those kinds of things. If you've got master data which might be uh, your Bible. On the back of your Bible, you've got a little ISBN number. That's the number. That's the important piece. That identifies your Bible. The metadata, almost the attributes, have to go with that. It's meta, because it's with, permanently together with that piece of data. Separately, those things don't make sense. It's like you and I. Outside of Christ, we don't make any sense. We don't make any sense outside of Christ. But with Him, with him it all makes sense why because we can glorify him which is ultimately what we were created to to do so he would want us with him every waking second he wants us with him where he is and here's our part in this that we may behold his glory that you may behold my glory is what he says which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. We're going to behold the glory of Jesus. We're going to behold it. We're going to look full in his wonderful face. Isn't that the song from the, the ladies meeting yesterday? And the ladies would know this. John chapter 1 verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, speaking of Christ. And we beheld his glory. As of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory, which is full of grace and truth. The word will also say that there was no comeliness to him. There was nothing that would attract us to Christ physically. 
And yet we beheld his glory, which was full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. You know that, that song, Waves of Mercy, Waves of Grace? Mm-hmm. love that song. Um, but it means, it means uh, wave after wave after wave when you go and have a look at that text. Wave after wave of grace upon grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. What is the glory of Jesus? Well, the glory of Jesus is that He was God. The glory of Jesus is that, is, is that He was prepared to become His own creation in order to save His creation. The true glory of Jesus is in the grace of God. The glory of Jesus is in grace which finds fulfillment in you and in me. We are the fruit of the cross which was ultimately the instrument of grace. The gloriousness of Christ is going to be investigated, studied and celebrated for all eternity, always always reaching but never quite attaining we will never fully understand the depths of his love and the outworking of that in grace which he through his own sacrifice has reconciled us back to him for purpose that we would know him that we would know him his desire is that we would be with him together with him complete with him looking upon the grace which is the reason we're there looking at him in the first place. This is his desire. His desire is this way because we were given, we were given to Christ. Because the love, because the love which God had for Christ, he had from the foundation of the world. God didn't need us. There were three in the Trinity He had company. He doesn't need us for company. He doesn't need us for for any other reason ultimately than we're a gift to his son. God is love. 1 John 4 will tell us, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. Love finds expression in an outward working. Love finds expression when it lands on an object. The father loved the son. It's proper love. It's full love. It's absolute love. But it finds an expression in the Father loving the Son. How did He express that love? Well, He created a world. He created a world out of which there would be a bride that was going to be pulled from Christ's own work. And that bride was going to be the ultimate expression of His glory through His grace. Is this making sense? We are the ultimate expression and we become the ultimate expression of Christ's glory by accepting his grace. And for eternity, we're going to be praising him for it. For eternity, we're going to be praising him for it. When does eternity start? The moment you know God, because this is eternal life, that you would know God. How is it that Christ could walk through this world which is the world, the cosmos, that which we're in, and still be eternal in nature and still have eternal life because he fully knew God. He fully knew God. And that's an offer to you and I. It's God's desire that we would know him. We've seen that in Hosea. Jesus' desire is that we would be there with him, that we would see the glory. We would see the glory, ultimately, that the Father's given him through us even. We're incidental in this. We're incidental in this love relationship. But praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we are. And the incredible benefit that comes to us through through this love relationship between the Father and the Son. Verse 25, he says, O righteous Father. O righteous Father. The first place and the only place in John where Jesus will say, O righteous Father. That word righteous speaks of his justice. He's about to cross the brook Kidron. 
He's about to be abused, spat on, his beard pulled out, his back flayed open. He's about to be crucified, mocked, ridiculed. He's about to suffer unjustly. Jesus is about to suffer unjustly. And he says, righteous father, just father. How do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile God's justice, God's love, his mercy and his grace with God's wrath? Well, justice is the key. You see, sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. And your good works, I'm sorry, are not of the same continuum as your sins. You cannot atone. You cannot make up your sins with good works. They're two different commodities. It's apples and oranges. I sound like a maths teacher. But it's apples and oranges. Good works and sins are not on the same continuum. You can't put them on the scales. They're not the same commodity. Sin, sin requires sacrifice. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Leviticus 17.11 will tell us. How is it that God can be both just, the justifier as well? Well, Christ became, Christ became that sacrifice for us. A better sacrifice than the ones we just saw in Hebrews. He became an eternal sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, who once sacrificed didn't need to be sacrificed again. This is the glory of His grace. This is the love relationship that we enter into when we come to Christ Jesus. O oh, just Father righteous father perfect in action pouring out wrath on christ who was perfect who paid for our sins there's no get out of jail free card here our sins were paid for they weren't just they weren't just forgotten god chooses not to remember because they've been paid for god knows everything he knows what you've done he knows what you're going to do not that you want to do it but it's been paid for. It's been paid for by the righteous transaction that took place on the cross. Our punishment on Jesus. His righteousness imputed to us and now we have entrance. And now we have entrance into heaven. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. This is the ninth I, I have in, uh, in this uh, prayer of Christ. I have known you. This is Christ's gift to us. We can know the Father. But you say Romans chapter 1 says everybody knows the Father. So let's go to Romans chapter 1 and have a look at it. Romans chapter 1. Pick it up from verse 16. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You want to suppress the truth? Be unrighteous. <laughs> we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I'm not suggesting you do that. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. But there's a, there's a thought process there almost, but what can be known of God is manifest in them. And I love the apologetic of the eyeball, and we're not going to get into it right now. But the apologetic of the eyeball, which cannot function if it weren't created as a working <coughs> unit. It cannot function. There is no middle ground. We would have been eaten if we couldn't see. It, perfect apologetic. What, is known to be, what, is, what can be known of God is known even in ourselves. Anybody who gets up and looks in the mirror, and if you don't have a mirror, you look into the pond. So that guy on the island looks into the sea on a calm day and he sees his face. There's an apologetic of creation, of the creator, something, someone, Yahweh God, created us. And all men know this. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, wait a minute, knowledge of God, that's eternal life, isn't it? Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, 
they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made by corruptible man. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You are the new God. Everybody, everybody has an opportunity to know God. But if you don't glorify him as God, then you don't know creator God. You have the opportunity to know him. If you're a living, breathing, carbon life form, you have, and that's humans because we have a spirit. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to know your creator. That's mind-blowing. And it's what he desires. It's what he desires. That's why these terrible sacrifices were in place. So that we could come to him. So that we could have communion with him. So that we could know him. That's why we see Christ on the cross. That's how he's glorified. Because through his grace, we come to him. And for all eternity, we'll be celebrating that. Jesus says, O just, O righteous Father, the world has not known you. But I have known you. And these have known that you sent me these he's talking about us because his disciples he was talking about them specifically now from verse 20 he said i do not pray for them alone but for those who will believe he's talking about us we know that god sent christ into the world as a propitiation for us so that we could be reconciled back to him we know that we need to glorify him we need to dig in deeper to understand and to know him and to love him better and more because this is eternal life that we would know the father verse 26 and i have declared that means i have made known i have made obvious i have made it known i've spoken it here's a declaration i have declared to them your name that's the onama that's the allness the character the fullness of god i have declared this to them He's declared this to them and will declare it. Well, how's he going to do that? He has declared it. How's he going to continue declaring it? Well, I pray that's what happens every Sunday morning in every church that stands up and preaches Jesus. That we would declare the name, the character, the love and the grace we find in Christ Jesus. That we would declare who God is. He doesn't want sacrifice. He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants fellowship. He wants it so badly that he would sacrifice of himself to get it. And ultimately we would glorify him for it. He says, I have declared, and this is the last I have in the prayer of Jesus. I have declared to them your name and I will declare it through us. We need to be declaring the name, the character, the person of God who we see fulfilled in Christ Jesus the radiance of the glory of God no man has seen God and yet Hebrews 1 will tell us Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily we worship Jesus don't we when we come to a worship service it's to worship Jesus you, know, you, you can kind of get stuck on that because the word Jesus is something that you, you don't always say out in public because you know, unless you've kicked your toe, the world celebrates when you say Jesus then. But if you say Jesus out in public, it's almost, eh, now they're going to know I'm a Christian. We worship Jesus. There is nothing this world has. There is nothing this world can give us. But in Christ, in Christ, we can know Creator God. We can know Creator God. We need to be declaring that the way that Christ has declared it to the world. That the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. That Christ would take up residence in us. That the love with which God loved Christ may be in us. Nobody's ever loved you that much. Nobody's ever going to love you that much. You cannot consider what that much love means even for you to try and give it to someone. Your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad, all of these are close but carnal. They're as close as we can get, but they're carnal. God's perfect love can dwell within us. God's perfect love can dwell within us in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Colossians 1 verse 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Now we're coming to the communion table this morning. We're going to do communion together. And the reason why we do communion together is because Christ told us to. He told us to celebrate, to remember Him. What is it that we were remembering? His blood poured out, His body broken. What is it that we're remembering? Well, it's exactly those things, but what did those things purchase for us? What did the blood poured out, what did the body broken purchase for us? His body broken, the veil torn, entrance into the holy place, which without the blood we'd be burned up, but covered in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins, and yet there was shedding of blood. There was shedding of perfect blood. Our kinsman redeemer, the second Adam, the second man, the perfect man who came to redeem, who came to redeem through his own flesh. And so join me in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 11. Let's celebrate as we think for a second on why this is so important to us. Why is this so necessary to us? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly. And this is speaking of the Old Testament priesthood. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They covered sins by God's grace and His mercy on all of those before Christ. They covered sins to the point where those who put their faith in that sacrifice and had communion with God after obeying what He had put in place, that system, they could have communion with God, but it never took the sins away. It was imperfect to take sins away. But this man, that's a capital M, this Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made a footstool. For by one offering, he perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's you and I. That's you and I in this life. God sees us. God sees us, we know, from, from Romans 8, 29. He sees us as glorified only because he sees the beginning from the end. He knows that the outworking is glorification and ultimately that we would be glorifying God. And yet, this sacrifice, while we're here, is for those that we would be made perfect through the work of Christ us who are being sanctified, us who are being set apart. We have been set apart and we're being set apart unto the work of Jesus. But the Holy Spirit, who witnesses to us after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law or my laws in their hearts. So if God desires to know us, just thinking back for a second, if, if God desires to know us, why did he give us the law? Why is it important if, if Christ has come and we're celebrating him at communion now, but if Christ has come, why is the Old Testament important? Well, Christ in John chapter 5, sorry, in, in Matthew chapter 5, would say that not one jot or tittle of this law is going to fade away. He came to complete it. He came to, uh, to perfect the law. He came that we could have life and life abundant. The law, the law will give us an understanding, a knowledge of God. The law is perfect. The problem with the law was you and I. <laughs> the law is perfect. And it will not fade away. It is knowing God. You want to know God? Well, we should spend some time in the Old Testament too. And, and, and who, who would not want to spend all of their time in these passages in John that we're in at the moment? But we see God. We see His heart even through the Old Testament because it's perfect. But the law, He will put into our hearts now under the new covenant... And in their minds, I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, because of this brethren, having boldness to enter. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about the boldness that we have to come before Creator God? 
if you were going before a president of any country, choose one, you'd make sure your pants were clean and it, and there'd still be a little bit of, a, oh, I hope I get this right. We come boldly. And we're told to come boldly. The only way we can come boldly is if we understand what's been done. Do we know Jesus and his perfect work on the cross? If we know him, we have boldness to enter. Not arrogance to enter. Not disrespect to enter. But we have boldness because we know that he wants us there. God wants us in his presence. And we have boldness to come into his presence because of what's been done for us. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And in that we see communion. In that we see communion. And Paul will tell us, um, and I love this 1 Corinthians 11 passage for communion. But Paul will say that that which he's received from the Lord. And again, and I say it every time. Don't give anybody that which you haven't received from the Lord. We're to admonish each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're to, uh, we're, we're to encourage each other. There's to be incredible unity. We're to use the word for all the good purposes that it's given to us. But let it be received in us first before we give it to somebody else. Paul would say, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we have the piece of bread, which we do in remembrance. We do in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Remember that his body was broken and his body was the veil which torn open for us gained entrance, gained entrance into that holy place. We come boldly because there's no curtain anymore. We come boldly because there's no separation anymore, but it's because of the body of Jesus broken for us. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you would, <laughs> that you would love Christ so much. Father, that you would ordain this thing that we know as the world and the universe and creation. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you loved us this much because it would glorify you so much. Lord, our imputed value in you, that you would come, that you would come into your creation. Lord, that your body would be broken for us, that we would gain entrance into the most holy place. We remember these things even this morning as we partake of your body together in Jesus' name. It's in the same manner. <laughs> it's in the same manner. And perhaps it's in that, in that bold, reverent manner. But it's in the same manner. He took the cup after supper saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And we've just looked at that new covenant. Hebrews 10 references Jeremiah 31. The new covenant. A better covenant. Bought through the eternal blood of Christ. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Man had a problem. That problem was separation from God who desired us to know him. God through Christ Jesus came sacrificed himself took on the wrath of God and now offers us and now offers us an opportunity to come into his presence as we make him lord of our lives as we turn from our sins and yes we turn from our sins we put that behind us we repent one of these nasty words but we do these things because of so much so much more that we're given in Christ as we do these things, this is what we're proclaiming when we take the cup together. We're proclaiming the good news 
The death of Christ without his resurrection isn't good news. That's not what Paul's saying. You're proclaiming the gospel. You're proclaiming what Jesus achieved for you and for me. And as we take this cup, as we take this cup, let's make sure that our hearts are right before the Lord. I didn't say that your heart was, was perfect. I didn't say that you're never going to sin ever again. I didn't say that you're not going to have things that trouble you and are difficult. But let's make sure that we understand this boldness, the sacrifice of Christ. It's a picture of his blood, holy blood that was poured out for you and for me. Let's apply this blood as into our own lives as, as we remember him and therefore come boldly before his throne room to glorify him. Let's know God this morning. That's the offer. And so, Father, we thank you for this blood, this precious atoning blood of Christ Jesus, your son. We thank you, Father, that apart from this, we have no way to come into your presence. We don't belong in your presence apart from this, but now being engrafted through your sacrifice, Lord, we can come and we can come boldly because of what you've done. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you as we celebrate you together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I know all of you. <laughs> But if you're struggling with any of this, if any of this is, is just know God, know God. If you need help knowing God, reach out to those around you, reach out to those um, who you know in the church. Get into the word. Know God. It's what we're created to do, to know him, to glorify him, to love him.